This video is a plea for truth, democracy, and regulation in online gaming. It's about a rising schism of cognitive dissonance caused by a new form of consumer fraud that emerged in the last decade without anybody really noticing. It's about the rights of online gamers and users of all social media, not just as consumers, but as democratic citizens. And if you follow it to the end, you will find yourself on the wrong side of a shield wall. I invite you to meditate on this subject with me further to the backdrop of gameplay from Overwatch, one of the games in question. You see me here playing as my avatar, Cuthbert, and my favorite character, a shield bearer called Reinhardt. My name is Lars Bohr. During its public beta in 2015, I was obsessed with Overwatch, Blizzard Entertainment's flagship product of the last decade. I was addicted to its team-based competitive gameplay, infatuated with its aesthetic design, and impressed with its social networking features. To me, it was more than a novel online shooter. It was a worthy successor to Team Fortress 2, the game that I met my wife playing in 2008. I ran TF2's largest community, called The Last Gunslingers from the game's launch in 2007 to 2009. Likewise, I was Overwatch's most avid and connected player at launch. But that changed in 2016, when Blizzard Entertainment implemented a ranked game mode called Competitive Play. I disliked Competitive Play immediately, because the alternate game modes of Quick Play and Competitive Play fractured the player base and my network of friends. Teams became harder to organize, and the preference of each player for quick play or competitive play dictated who I was able to get together with. Players also had to be close in rank to team up with each other and compete. But there was a much more profound problem under the surface of competitive play which I did not see at first. It emerged to me gradually, as I played hundreds of matches, grinding up and down the rank and ladder with millions of other players. My sense of the problem was not drawn from information, but born from intuition, a vague feeling of unfairness that I distrusted for a long time and mistook for the simple disappointment of losing in competition. A good player learns not to indulge their own soreness, so I tamped those feelings down as one does. But the longer I suppressed my sense of unfairness, the longer it persisted and the more it grew. I started to understand its origin slowly and doubtingly, from hearsay among my friends in the game who described a shadowy matchmaking factor called MMR. My growing suspicions about the nature of MMR were confirmed in a forum post by lead Overwatch designer Scott Mercer, who clearly and nonchalantly stated in 2016 that ranked competition is subject to algorithmic handicapping. The system worked on the explicit double standards of skill rating, which is a competitive player's rank, and a hidden metric based on performance data called matchmaking rating. At the time, nobody seemed to quite understand the meaning of Mercer's words, even Overwatch's designers themselves. But I did, and in 2017, I made a formal complaint on Blizzard's forum, arguing to remove matchmaking rating from competitive play. My argument was based on Mercer's statement, and the simple, obvious principle that ranked competition should not be algorithmically handicapped. When Blizzard ignored my complaint, it turned into a long discussion with other players on the forum. Debate and polling replaced my obsession for playing the game itself. And though I stopped playing Overwatch completely, I continued debate and polls on the subject of algorithmic handicapping for four years. My polls have proven with strong majority votes that players want transparent terms of use for competitive play and non-discriminatory treatment from the matchmaking system. In three polls on Blizzard's now defunct Battle.net forum, we rejected the handicapping of ranked matches with votes of 295 to 56, 320 to 42, and 403 to 50. On the new Blizzard forum, 
We have also voted to ban handicapping of ranked matches at 388 to 64 and 528 to 94. To this day, no Activision Blizzard representative has responded to my poll results and thousands of players complained against their matchmaking system. Earlier this year, I took aim at Blizzard Entertainment's umbrella company, Activision Publishing Incorporated, and their filings for the matchmaker with the United States Patent Office. Activision's matchmaker patent filing contains a description of invention, which is strongly correlated with Blizzard's description of the matchmaker and Overwatch. According to Activision Blizzard, the matchmaker ensures the quality of gameplay. It designates teams to make every match engaging, near 50% chance for either team to win. That type of match provides players with the most exciting and addictive user experience. But because it ensures those 50% odds by arranging teams based on hidden skill metrics, MMR, the matchmaker covertly handicaps competitive matches, favors new players over experienced players, fails to prove the skill difference between players, and lowers the quality of gameplay across all competitive tiers. How is such a travesty possible? It is possible because of Activision Blizzard's deception by omitting information about handicapping from their product. It is possible amidst the global dearth of regulation for tech companies like Activision Blizzard and a prevailing global culture of capitalistic moral relativism. It is possible because the public withholds judgment on private corporations and the operation of their game holdings. But most of all, it is possible because of players' reticence to demand transparency in our terms of use and fair rules in what is being sold to us as an eSport. Most players do not even realize their matches are being handicapped, and those of us who know of algorithmic handicapping fail to see its implications. Overwatch's own designers seem to have missed the point. Let me give you their overview of the subject. Overwatch's designers say they balance matches with MMR. The system sorts the 12 players from each match into teams based on the merit each player has shown in matches past. Matchmaking uses merit tracking algorithms, MMR, to keep matches from being uneven. Principal Overwatch designer Scott Mercer explains, when the matchmaker creates a match, it determines the percentage chance for each team to win based on the match it made. The vast majority of matches are usually near to 50%, especially if you're a player closer to the median skill rating and you're not in a group. When we do put you in a match that we know isn't a 50-50, we adjust your SR gain or loss based on your calculated chance of winning. We model the synergistic effects of players being together in a group. Based upon the data we see in groups, we predict the win percentage for each team. The amount of MMR and SR you go up or down isn't simply a matter of whether you won or lost, and what was your predicted chance of winning. There's a couple other things at work. One is the matchmaker's confidence in what your MMR should be. Play a lot of games, it gets more certain. Don't play Overwatch for a while, it gets less certain. You go on a large win or loss streak, it gets less certain. The more certain the matchmaker is about your MMR, the less your MMR will change in either direction based on a win or loss. We also do evaluate how well you played the heroes you used in a match. The comparison is based on historical data of people playing a specific hero. While it's a minor factor compared to wins and losses, doing so does help us determine your skill more accurately and faster. And this is where I disagree with Mercer. In quick play, we do not count wins and losses as we do in competitive play. We do not stake our rank and reputation on a number like we do with SR. And MMR skews everyone's SR. Because if you are a relatively skilled player for your SR, handicapping MMR makes your teams worse than they would be on average by random chance. Inversely, if you are a relatively unskilled player for your rank, Handicapping, MMR, makes your teams better. The more I have thought about this subject, the more I have realized that it is a battle of semantics. This discussion has a fulcrum, a single word that it turns around. A 
a word that Blizzard has chosen incorrectly, misappropriated from the design parlances of casual, non-competitive games. The word is balance, which is actually handicapping in the context of a competitive game. Dictionary.com defines a handicapped contest as one in which certain disadvantages or advantages are placed upon competitors to equalize their chances of winning. For example, in Old Quebec, French Canada, parishioners had a tradition of racing home from church in horse-drawn sleighs or wagons, which they would handicap by placing different numbers and sizes, weights, of passengers in either vehicle. That's an example of a friendly competition where handicapping is appropriate, because the important thing isn't who wins the race, it's the closeness of the race and the fun to be had along the way. The race itself is merely a pretense for a good time. Any scoring that took place between the drivers would be in jest. That is what some of us expect from a game mode like Quick Play. But players expect competitive play to be different. We have a rank and skill rating, SR, that ticks up or down when we win or lose. That number is both our reputation and our right to compete with other players of our caliber. Handicapping makes light of that number. And in turn, it makes light of competitive Overwatch players. When you play competitive Overwatch, you may be a horse pulling your team along, or you may be a passenger just along for the ride. And the handicapping system might designate you as such correctly or incorrectly. But those designations happen to determine the nature of every match you play. This is where the difference between individual and team competition comes in. Players participate in matches as teams, but as individuals in the ranking system. And that is the big lie. Handicapping teams is not the same as treating individuals fairly in the ranking system. Blizzard wrongly conflates those ideas, distorting players' very notion of what fair competition is and what they are doing in competitive play. Blizzard says that handicapped matches are fair for competitive players, and that is patently false. The abstract of Activision's matchmaking patent, code US1032235 one b 2 reads as follows. A matchmaking system and method is provided that facilitates optimization of player matches for multiplayer video games. The system may provide a generalized framework for matchmaking using historical player data and analytics. The framework may facilitate automatic determinations of an optimal mix of players and styles to produce the most satisfying user experiences. The system may dynamically update analytical processes based on statistical or otherwise observed data related to gameplay at any given time. In this manner, the system may continually tune the matchmaking process based on observations of player behavior, gameplay quality, and or other information. Nowhere in its description does the patent suggest that this system could be applied to a ranked, ladder-style game. I'm sure that consideration would have been lost on the examining lawyers unless there are gamers working at the United States Patent Office, and I know that the USPO does not determine or enforce the law. But I know that the Federal Trade Commission is supposed to enforce consumer protections against false claims in advertising, such as calling an algorithmically handicapped game mode ranked competitive play. The FTC website states that the FTC Act prohibits unfair or deceptive advertising in any medium, that is, advertising must tell the truth and not mislead consumers. A claim can be misleading if relevant information is left out or if the claim implies something that's not true. With vague wording and deception by omission, Activision is tricking players to accept an absurd and dystopian paradigm for online gaming, algorithmically handicapped ranked matches. To understand why the ranked game mode of Overwatch is not truly competitive, and why the branding of ranked competitive play is false, we must examine anti-competitive aspects of design in Activision's patented matchmaking system. According to Activision's patent description, the scoring engine, which is analogous to SR and MMR, allows the matchmaking system to operate based on variables that may include, without limitation, a relative skill level, 
a presence of preferred players, e.g. clanmates or friends, a team composition, e.g. playstyle, avatar specialization, a time that a given player has been waiting to be matched, e.g. in a game lobby, a player preference, and or other information used to assess a potential match. Relative skill level is a crucial aspect of the problem with this design. It implies that the matchmaker is discriminating between players within the same ranks of the latter, which defies players' expectation of impartial treatment in ranked competition. The patent goes on that, in one implementation, the analytics and feedback engine may analyze game data, e.g., whether a given game level or match favors playstyles, historical player data, e.g., types and styles of player, strengths and weaknesses of players, etc., and or other information to assess the quality of player experiences. The analytics and feedback engine may analyze game data to determine satisfying types of gameplay that should be provided through the matchmaking process. For example, the analytics and feedback engine may determine whether given combinations of role types, e.g. sniper, run and gunners, etc., lead to satisfying gameplay. To illustrate Activision's business interest in the invention, the description continues, In some implementations of the invention, analytics and feedback engines may determine the quality score based on one or more business factors that describe a business value derived from a given gameplay session. For example, and without limitation, a business factor may include a business concern such as an amount of revenue derived from a given gameplay session, e.g., number for amount of in-game purchases, number of impressions of an advertisement or other ad-based revenue stream, etc., a level of customer engagement, and or other information that can be used to assess the level of value derived from a given gameplay session. For example, player information may include, without limitation, a style of gameplay, e.g. aggressive, a role preference, e.g an explicit by the player of such preference, a role actually played, a duration of gameplay sessions, a number of gameplay sessions played in a given login session, in-game items used or purchased by the player, membership in a clan or team, preferences to play with clanmates or friends, demographic information of the player, e.g. geographic location, gender, income level, etc win-loss records, scores, and or other information that may be used to determine whether a player will enjoy a given gameplay session, a match, and or a game. I assert that the implementation of Activision Publishing Incorporated's patented matchmaking invention in Overwatch's competitive play violates reasonable expectations of fair and transparent competition by algorithmically handicapping players' ranked matches. I further assert that Activision Blizzard's branding of a handicapped game mode as ranked competitive play is false advertising, enforceable under US Code Section 54 on false advertisement penalties. As often happens in legal issues, this dispute involves semantics. Nowhere does Activision say the word handicapping and the description of their patented matchmaker, but that is skirting a historically recognized term of game culture and gaming industry. It doesn't take an expert to infer that many aspects of the matchmaker described above constitute handicapping. There can be no doubt that the invention of handicapping sacrifices fair and transparent competition. The sacrifice is in order to make Overwatch more addictive as a product, at the expense of its best players, by stymieing their careers and converting their efforts into spectacle. In one passage of depraved usury from the patent description, Activision even describes how they would measure your biometrics for the purpose of making your experience more difficult and addictive. Examples of quality factors include, without limitation, a player quitting a match or gameplay session while other players are still playing, indicating dissatisfaction, a duration of game session, e.g., a longer duration may indicate greater satisfaction, a gameplay performance factor, e.g., a kill-to-death ratio in a shooter game, a lap time in a racing game, etc., where greater performance may indicate greater satisfaction, a player engagement factor, e.g., a speed of player input, 
a level of focus as determined from camera peripherals, etc., where greater engagement may indicate greater satisfaction, a competition level of a game, e.g., whether lopsided or not, where evenly matched games may indicate greater satisfaction, a biometric factor, e.g., facial expressions, pulse, body language, sweat, etc., explicit feedback from a player, e.g., responses to a survey, and or other observable metrics related to gameplay. Patents filed in the early 2000s by other game-holding companies have been written with more honest language about handicapping and less sinister machination. This 2006 patent by Microsoft, for example, is for the invention of handicapping in a Bayesian skill scoring framework. Bayesian theory is an interpretation of the idea of probability. Bayes' theorem is used to describe the probability of events based on conditions related to the events. Both Microsoft and Activision use Bayesian theory in the design of their respective handicapping inventions, but there are significant differences between them. Most importantly, the Microsoft patent describes active, explicit, and voluntary handicap selection by the participating players. The patent abstract calls it a skill scoring framework that allows for handicapping an individual game player in the gaming environment in preparation of matching the game player with other game players, whether for building teams or assigning competitors or both. By introducing handicapping into the skill scoring framework, a highly skilled player may select one or more game characteristics, e.g., a less than optimal racing vehicle, reduced character capabilities, etc., and therefore be assigned a handicap that allows the player to be matched with lower skilled players for competitive gameplay. Handicaps may apply positively or negatively a player's skill score during the matching stage. Handicaps may also be updated based on the game outcomes of the gameplay in which they were applied. Note the similarities between Microsoft and Activision systems. They both try to measure player skill and adjust their calculations based on match results. But also note the differences. Most significantly, a game featuring Microsoft's handicapping system would allow unevenly matched players to choose the form of handicapping they receive. This is a crucial difference in terms of use. It is relevant to a player's consent of use because it implies that the application would inform players that handicapping is in place. It is also relevant to their consent of use in a ranked competitive game mode which players wrongly assume to have unbiased matchmaking. Further on Microsoft's invention, the choice of handicap implies that skilled players would not be systematically segregated from each other. Activision's matchmaker defects handicapping by the arrangement of teams and the formation of matches based on hidden performance data about each player. In a bipolar and numerically lopsided pattern, it assigns teams to offset the differences in skill between players. The matchmaker does this in secret, informed by a form of rank and reputation that players cannot see, called matchmaking rating. In Overwatch, Activision has found a subtle but profoundly unethical application for mathematical statistics. Overwatch is designed to constantly track player performance and update its own state of knowledge. That state of knowledge is called matchmaking rating, which informs the algorithmic handicapping of each match. But unlike skill rating, matchmaking rating is completely hidden from view. Players with high MMR receive no recognition from their peers and do not even know it for themselves. Much toxicity in the Overwatch community stems from cognitive dissonance, a kind of psychological distress caused by algorithmic handicapping. When a player succeeds in one match, they are challenged in their next match by design. Wondering what changed, they can attribute the sudden challenge to unrelated factors by mistake. They may blame their own character selection and actions, or those of their team. I've been toxic in my own matches. I've chastised many of my own teams who didn't deserve it, especially new and inexperienced players who were still learning the ropes, because they weren't meant to play with me in the first place. They were destined for lower ranks, just as I was destined for higher ones. But algorithmic handicapping intervenes to everyone's misfortune. We are not in a proving ground. We are in a mill, churning inexorably with players who are not our equals. I sound immodest, 
but I face this problem with tens of millions of players like me. It is a massive and systemic problem, but it's a simple problem, and it's blizzards to fix if they have the mind. Dictionary.com defines a travesty as a grotesque or debased likeness or imitation, an artistic burlesque of a serious work or subject, characterized by ludicrous incongruity of treatment or subject matter. Algorithmic handicapping makes competitive Overwatch a travesty because it forces us, in every match, to play against those who are most like ourselves and with those who are least like ourselves. Want a teammate who is as good at Hero X as you are? Matchmaking rating prevents you from ever meeting them. At every instance, in every match, matchmaking rating ensures that you can only be that player's adversary, never their ally. And if you group up with such a player, matchmaking rating prevents you from finding a fair match to play in. If you would still defend the matchmaking rating system as fair-handed viewer, consider your principal interest as a competitive player, which is victory. Now consider these questions. When you queue for a match, you deserve the same chance of victory as any other player in the match, do you not? Would you accept a system that explicitly subtracts from your chance of victory and adds to your chance of defeat? If you are an experienced player, do you accept that you must babysit the inexperienced? If you are an inexperienced player, do you want to be babysat? This is about more than just winning or losing at a game. It is about the poetry of group synergy, of lucky random encounters. The uncanny lack of that poetry is what players feel when they rail about incompetency and toxicity in their teammates. Blizzard redacted that poetry when they imputed the handicapping system into competitive play. They designed the matchmaking rating system to ensure that every match is a struggle, and it comes directly at the cost of players' mobility in the skill ranking system. Algorithmic handicapping does not make competitive play fair or even fun for long-term players. It makes matches protracted and desperate because that is what gives the appearance, the illusion of fairness, regardless of the truth. And it leads to repeat sales from Smurf account buyers who try to eschew the system. When Blizzard took the decision to apply matchmaking rating in competitive Overwatch, I think they were driven by fear. They feared that players would reject their game as unfair when they had one-sided matches and especially when they had one-sided losses. So they fundamentally undermined the fairness and transparency of competitive play to prop up the illusion of fair matches. In so doing, they made the game paradoxically frustrating and profoundly addictive. Thinking that matchmaking rating worked for quick play and apprehensive of the negative customer experience that could result without matchmaking rating's careful stage work, they put it in competitive play and we've been suffering for it ever since. Blizzard warped their own game to suit their business interests or the interests of other stakeholders at the cost of user experience, ultimately failing Overwatch players. Why do so many game designers and publishers fail to recognize the principles of fair competition and the competitive games they give us players? It is because in the corporate world, the creation process inevitably falls prey to greed, to blind, slavering stakeholder interest, all forms of commercial interest. Marketability trumps integrity behind closed doors. And Overwatch players themselves are to blame when they tell Blizzard that one-sided matches are unfair or boring, in the double standard of skill rating and matchmaking rating, Blizzard is trying to give us what we want. But a good parent knows the difference between wants and needs. Players want engaging matches, but need to compete in an equitable system. One-sided matches are a perfectly natural thing, and we would see a lot of them at the onset of an impartial matchmaking system. But at the end of a great sorting process of natural selection, we might have clearly established leagues and be able to expect some standards of play outside of the bottom rank. Instead of experiencing natural winning and losing streaks, we get a carefully monitored slow drip with victory and defeat in nearly as equal measure as matchmaking can arrange. The effects of the system are confusion, 
incumbency, and a completely incoherent narrative for every competitive player's career. Algorithmic handicapping detaches a player's merit from their rank and reputation. We competitive players have the urge to deepen our knowledge of Overwatch and keep discovering its nuances by playing with our peers. But we can't find our peers in a system that decides the nature of every match we play by pitting the best of us against each other. For the SR system to really work, it must be the only system. Teams should not be balanced based on anything besides their SR and their group size. Every metric outside of skill rating and group size should be discarded. If it is not possible to make balanced matches with groups under those conditions, then competitive play should be solo queue only. The phenomenon that Overwatch players call one-tricking, playing as a single character in a game that contains dozens, is a natural consequence of performance-based SR adjustment. When players see that they are being graded on their own stats rather than the win-lose result of the match, it demotivates them from being real team players. Instead of doing what is best for their team's chance of winning the match, they start doing what is best for their chances of racking up big stats. Matchmaking rating works like reverse karma. If you are interested to watch your SR trend up and down and figuring out winning and losing strategies, and no governing system outside of your SR and your group size can serve your interest. A handicapped match is much more likely to hang in the balance, but by handicapping a match, matchmaking rating makes its outcome intrinsically unrelated to the skill of individual players and groups participating. It is absurd to increase and decrease SR based on defeat and victory in handicap matches. No competitive Overwatch player has a fair chance of winning a match according to their skill. Because of algorithmic handicapping, unskilled and inexperienced players are more likely to win, while skilled and experienced players are more likely to lose. Because algorithmic handicapping defies pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is our birthright as human beings. We evolved to use the very stars for navigation. Our brains have grown to run advanced heuristics and wars and heated battles against enemy tribes. Games like Overwatch are allegories for battle, which we play to enjoy our faculty of pattern recognition. But matchmaking rating circumvents the math that we all would use to understand Overwatch and game an impartial matchmaking system. It contradicts the calculations that we all make based on reasonable assumptions about how matchmaking works. We assume that matchmaking is impartial, but that is not true. Overwatch's competitive play systematically deceives players on a grand scale. When the fact of handicapping and the metrics of MMR are hidden from players, it takes away players' ability to rely on their own senses. When matches are handicapped without our understanding or even our awareness, it debases our perception of the game we are playing. For further reading on this subject, read Adam Alter's book, Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked, for more information on the subject of gaming addiction. For more information on the subject of handicapping and other aspects of game theory and democracy, read The Wisdom of Crowds by James Sirowiecki. In the years since I quit competitive Overwatch, my focus has shifted toward human and animal rights advocacy. In future episodes on this channel, I resume my campaign to teach the world about curry, which I have formulated to be the most sustainable, convenient, affordable, nutritious, and digestible food in the world. In Lars's Lentils episode 1, we learned to make curry with pulses as the main ingredient and looked at the aspirational nature of veganism in association with the sport of highlining. Curry saves you money and makes you feel great. Gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. Spend just an hour in the kitchen per month to stock your freezer with homemade frozen meals that are appetizing, healthy, and practically free. I will no longer be making video game content for the foreseeable future. This is now a lifestyle channel focused on health, home economics, human and animal rights. Join me on Mission Curry. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Click the join button for access to exclusive, members-only videos, and get on my Patreon to support me in making more episodes like this. Until next time, remember, it all starts with food.